This is the second class in the sequence, and the title is A Question of Dates. Dates are surprisingly important and surprisingly controversial because they are surprisingly uncertain. Here is the conventional view of the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean in about oh, 1300 BC. You've got those great empires there. You have Egypt, you have the Hittites, you have the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and then you have that pretty pink, which is the Greek Mycenaean civilization. And here we have the present consensus as to what happened. And do notice that I've now put the Bronze Age collapse in inverted commas, which suggests it may not have happened. And it may not have happened. But the present consensus is that around 1200 BC, the Near East or the Levant or the Eastern Mediterranean world, call it what you will, was dominated by those civilizations, Egypt, the Hittites, Assyria, Mycenaean Greece and the others. And yet by 1100 BC, with the exception of Egypt, which was permanently weakened, and Assyria, which was radically diminished for many centuries, all of these great kingdoms or great empires had been swept away. Remember what I said last week, there seems to have been a total systems collapse because when you have a collapse, there is generally some kind of recovery. Even after the Crusaders took Constantinople and burned it and partitioned the Byzantine Empire, the civilization of the Byzantine Empire continued and the Byzantine state reformed itself. Even after what looks like a total collapse, you very often have a recovery, and yet there was no recovery after this collapse, just three centuries of darkness, which was followed by a new beginning. This whole story may require an explanation. Indeed, it does require an explanation. But the conventional explanations rely on a catastrophe. The sea peoples came and did it, or there was a chain of volcanic eruptions, or a chain of earthquakes, or the climate changed, making everything much drier so the crops failed and people died, or there was some awful pandemic disease, or something of that nature. But another explanation may be that there was no Bronze Age collapse. There was no three centuries of darkness. It may be that the conventional dating that during the past 200 years has grown up to describe events before the classical period are a radical mistake and that if you move everything forward a few centuries the gap closes there is no need to talk about a bronze age collapse because there were no three centuries of darkness oh no doubt there were sea peoples it's well attested in the egyptian literature at least that there was an invasion of Egypt. It's well attested in the Hittite records that many of the cities were burned. The archaeological evidence suggests a great deal of violence at some point between the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, but there may not have been three centuries of darkness because everything that we've learned about chronology before about 800 BC is simply a mistake. This sounds like the kind of explanation a total crank would put forward. Indeed, let me go right to the end of these slides because rather than put this at the end, I think it is worth putting it at the beginning. Has anyone heard of the phantom time hypothesis? There are several of these, but the most famous of them 
is put forward by a German called Herbert Illig, and he claims that there was a conspiracy by the Holy Roman Emperor, by the Pope, and possibly the, the, the Byzantine Emperor, to fabricate three centuries in the Middle Ages. And that things like the, things like the Islamic invasions and the reign of Charlemagne, or the existence of Charlemagne, were fabricated. They were just made up at the end of the Middle Ages. And so the entire Carolingian period is a fabrication. And there's a phantom time running from 614 to 911 AD added to the Middle Ages. It is a bizarre theory. I think we're right to reject it out of hand. Indeed, what Illig does to justify his hypothesis is to say that when we moved from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar between the late 16th and, in our case, the middle of the 18th century, when we moved from one calendar to the other, we didn't move as many days as we should. There were three days missing. The two calendars fall out of synchronization by just under a day every century. Instead of moving 11 days in 1752, we should have moved by 13 days in order to put ourselves back to where the calendar was when Julius Caesar established it in the 40s BC. The easy answer to that is that when Pope Gregory commissioned his reformed calendar in the 16th century, his endeavour was not to reset the calendar to the time when Julius Caesar established it. His endeavour was to reset the calendar to the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And once you accept that, then the missing days disappear and there is no need to remove three centuries from the historical record. So there are lunatic chronologies going around, and these are entirely to be dismissed out of hand. There is a theory floating around at the moment that the whole of classical Greek and Roman literature was forged in the early Renaissance and that the classical past never existed. I haven't bothered checking into the grounds for these claims. There, there are so many strange theories floating around on the internet that you need to make them a particular academic study or you need unlimited time in order to entertain them. And I don't want to make a study of these things and I don't have unlimited time. What I'm saying is that there are some utterly groundless, there are some chronologies that are entirely without merit and they deserve no examination. Whereas the claim that there was no Bronze Age collapse is not entirely without merit. I find it doubtful. I find it doubtful not because I'm an expert on the period, but because... I do feel inclined to accept most consensuses in areas where I'm not a particular expert. Let me begin by looking at the nature of historical time. How do we know when things happened? To ask this question, to consider its importance, we need to step outside the bubble in which we and in which our ancestors have lived for many centuries, indeed perhaps 1,500 years. As far as we're concerned, those five dates that I give at random above, those are set in concrete. On the 4th of October 1492, Christopher Columbus sighted America. Oh, you can say, ah, but that's according to the Julian calendar. We then switch to another one. Well, yes, OK, so you can move it to another day in October. Except the calendar changed in the 1580s for Catholic Europe and in 1752 for us and in 1918 for Russia. Except for that, you can accept that Columbus sighted America on the 4th of October 1492 there's the death day for Queen Elizabeth. The first railway journey, 1804, 
the beginning of the Great War, and of course the 15th of September 1919, the city lit opens. And I'm sure some people have been waiting to get through on the telephones ever since. There's no doubt of this. It's uncontroversial. We accept this. It's part of the intellectual air that we breathe. But it is a radical break with the more distant past. It is a system made up by a Scythian monk, that is, a monk from what is now Romania. He lived in Rome at the end of the 5th, beginning of the first half of the 6th century AD, and he devised the BC AD chronology that we nowadays use. It was adopted by Bede, the great English historian in the 8th century, and because of his great reputation, it was steadily adopted throughout Western Europe until it became not only hegemonic, but the only dating system in use. Oh, the Byzantine Greeks, they used Anu Mundi. They used years since the creation of the world. And the Jews use a similar system. So there are these other systems. Oh, and the Muslims, they date time from Muhammad's flight from Mecca to Medina, I believe. But it doesn't matter whichever system you use, the Islamic system, the Jewish system, the Byzantine Greek, or our own BC AD system. You have a fixed point in time, and everything is dated with reference to that. And as long as we keep our own calendars in order, and there's every reason to suppose that we shall do that for the foreseeable future, there is absolutely no doubt of when things happened and what happened first. Try to do history, try to write history without knowing if something happened before or after something else. Until these systems of absolute dating came into being, people used partial and local dating systems. So you could use the regnal year of a king. So in the fifth year of Nero, 59 AD. Or, oh, actually, have a look at that blue box, the beginning of Luke, chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Traconitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. What a strange way of saying 28 AD. When Luke sat down to write his biography of Christ, he wanted to date things as precisely as he could, so he gave all of these reference points so that his most likely audience or readership would be able to relate to it, saying, ah, it happened then. There are just numerous dating systems. You could name years after magistrates, a most inconvenient dating system, if you ask me. The Romans do this. I was born in the third consulate of Marius. That is, I was born in 101 BC. Dates since the foundation of the city. That's a good one, used by Livy. It would probably have done a lot of good for the Romans if they had moved over completely to that. Or you could use Olympic cycles. The Greeks used that occasionally, starting in 776 BC. Or in the early Middle Ages, end of antiquity, early Middle Ages, you used the tax cycle of 15 years, begun by Diocletian, the fifth indiction, the seventh indiction, and so on. But these are all pretty inconvenient and they are local but over the past 1500 years there were substantial efforts before 1500 years but starting i suppose with saint jerome well eusebius saint jerome and then julius caesar scaliger in the 16th century there has been a lot of work by chronologers People who have taken all of these partial and local dates, 
and try to put them into a consistent timeline. Here is the title page of Scaliger's new work on the correction of times in eight books. This was published in 1583, this one, though I think it was published somewhat earlier than that, about 1514. It is a work of enormous industry and we still rely on it. If you say Julius Caesar was killed on the 14th of March 44 BC, you are probably relying on the work done by Scaliger in the 16th century who took the accounts of Caesar's murder and put them onto a single consistent timeline. Until the chronologers set to work, everything was a bit of a chaos. It was impossible to know who had lived before whom. If you read Richard Bentley's work on the letters of Phalaris, published in the 1690s, he spends a lot of time discussing when it was that Pythagoras actually lived. Was Attic Greek the prestige dialect of the Greeks at the time when Pythagoras lived? Bentley spends about 50 pages discussing that. It's something that we know implicitly. You just look it up in an encyclopedia, look it up on Wikipedia. What are the dates of Pythagoras? Ah, it was that. When did Attic Greek become the prestige dialect of Greek literature? Ah, somewhat later. Question solved. But until these men did their work, we just didn't know. Let's have a look at the kind of dating problems that we face with the Bronze Age. Now, this is an example. Let's take two ancient cities. They are discovered in Mesopotamia. <coughs> There's Mogadon and Karwash, two cities which are dug up by the archaeologists at the moment. They're not mentioned in the records of any neighbouring civilization, but the general condition of the ruins and the style of the cuneiform writing suggests similar dates probably in the 3rd millennium BC, but we don't know when in the 3rd millennium BC. We have two sets of king lists found, one for each city, giving the names of eight kings each. Ancient Mesopotamian cities liked to do this. This is a Sumerian king list. It gives a list of kings. Not saying, and this great king began to reign on the 14th of March, 2622 BC, oh, it's nothing like that, and this king reigned for 20 years, and the next one reigned for 15 years, and so it goes on, which is very useful for some purposes, but it's not useful for the purpose that we might have in mind. So here are two king lists, one for each city. You call this a relative chronology, insofar as you know that Belifat I reigned for 20 years and Midriff I for 10 years, you can work out how long between the third year of Belifat I and the fifth year of Midriff II. You can work that out if it's shown in a tablet that's dug up. You can work out, oh, it's X years. I can't be bothered to work it out myself, but you can do. It's a relative chronology insofar as the dates relate to each other, but it's also a floating chronology so far as this is a bubble of dates. You can relate times within this bubble of dates, but you cannot place this bubble of dates at any fixed time in the past relative to ourselves. It's not possible to relate dates between those two cities, and it's certainly not possible to fix dates in BC AD times. There are further problems with such lists. The first is that you may have multiple copies of these lists, and they all have slight variations. That's because the scribes making these lists were not paying proper attention, or they were just not sure. 
there may be confusion between rulers with the same name, especially when they follow each other. So Belifat II, was this done in the reign of Belifat II or Belifat III? And did a particular battle or was a particular building put up by Midriff III or by Midriff I? You get these problems. A question about the antiquity of royal numbering systems. They sometimes did, but quite often they didn't. They would just say, Belifat, the son of Corset. And so you assume, ah, that must be the second Belifat. No, they didn't do that. So this is a modern imposition. We're trying to make sense of it. And we may have got it wrong. This may exist in one copy, and it may be partly legible. Or perhaps it's been put together from multiple copies, all with variations, it's also possible that the reign of Midriff II, which is recorded as 20 years, began in the 20th year of Ninob. Perhaps he adopted his son as a joint ruler, and so you need to shorten that entire chronology uh, accordingly. How do you fix these dates in any meaningful sense? You can bring science to bear on this, and that does get us quite a long way. You have dendrochronology looking at tree ring patterns. You find a wooden bowl in the ruins of one of these cities and you look at the pattern of tree rings. You have those sequoia trees in I think California and you can try to relate the pattern of rings saying ah I think this is 2650 BC. It is useful, and it can help quite a lot, but it's more an art than a science. There's radiocarbon dating, which used to be taken as a very certain and and a very final way of dating things. It's just that radiocarbon dating, based on looking at the loss from organic remains of the radioactive isotopes of carbon, it seems that the rate of loss is not always constant and it depends on which method you use. So quite often samples which were dated in the 1950s to a particular period have been looked at at other times since and using a different carbon dating method have been dated to another time. It is also possible for contamination. I believe that if you take organic remains from the verge of the M25 and submit them to carbon testing, they often look very old indeed. That's to do with the pollution in the air. You have other systems, rehydroxylation dating, looking at the recombination of fired ceramic with moisture from the surrounding air, luminescence dating, looking at how long since certain mineral grains were last exposed to sunlight. There's a fairly new system trying to date lime plaster from structures. All of these have their uses, and taken together they can be useful, but they're mostly useful in the negative sense. I bring forward a piece of cloth saying this is the handkerchief of John the Baptist. It's submitted to carbon dating and it's, well, it's five years old. And so you dismiss this relic out of hand. But for getting a precise date, and especially a precise date from more than 2,000 years ago, is very hard. These rather sciencey dating methods, they are useful, but they do not give final information. We're stuck with relative chronology for the moment, and here's a good example. You find a text, you find a tablet, a fired clay tablet, which says, In the twentieth year of our mighty Lord Ninob, King Dornob of Carwash was poisoned by his eldest son. Here, you're able to relate the chronologies of those two cities. You have an event in one city dated according to the chronology of the other city, and so you can join those together. You can say from this that Dornob of Carwash came to power in year 10 of Ninob of Mogadon. That's good. It means that you can reasonably fix all dates in one city 
against the chronology of another city. But all you've done here is to make a larger bubble. It's still floating out there in time. You still don't know when it happened. It's useful for analysing the joint and several histories of the two cities so that you can now relate events in one to events in the other and say, well, it started here and moved to there. It still doesn't give you exact data. We now come to an attempt at absolute chronology, which is what we want. Here's another text discovered. The death of our Lord Cespit, which we think was the second, was presaged by a darkening of the moon while two wandering stars stood beside. Ah, we're going to make an assumption. This is Cespit the second, not Cespit the first, because of the style of writing. It's controversial, but it's sustainable. And we're now going to assume further that the text refers to a lunar eclipse and a conjunction with Mars and Jupiter. And I'm making this up because astronomy is not really my thing. The only time that this particular event could have happened in the third millennium BC is the 14th of March, 2876 BC. The death of Cespit II can be dated to March or April, 2876 BC. Therefore, Cespit II of Carwash died in 2876. Ankel I of Carwash came to power in 3036. Ninob of Mogadon came to power in 2896 BC. It also means that a reference to an earthquake, which we can now date to 2976 BC, gives an absolute date to an otherwise undated destruction of the Sumerian irrigation system. What you have is an astronomical event which can be dated with reasonable certainty and from that you have an absolute chronology. You know when both of these cities existed and you can fit them into the overall structure of Mesopotamian or Near Eastern history. Of course there are certain assumptions you are assuming that the text means what the translators say it does, and our knowledge of Sumerian and Akkadian, two of the main ancient Mesopotamian languages, is imperfect and has improved considerably in the past 120 years. And so a translation which you see published in about 1900 may no longer be sustainable with our modern knowledge, so you're assuming that that discovered text about the darkening of the moon with the two wandering stars, you're assuming that that has been accurately translated into English. It may not have been. You're also assuming that other dates in those tables have not been garbled. But making those two assumptions, as I said, you've converted a floating bubble of relative chronology into a fixed and absolute chronology. This is what we look for in ancient history to date things. It seems to us quite obvious that Rome was sacked in April 410. I'm sure I could look it up. I could, t I could give you the date in April when Alaric and the Goths walked into Rome. It's obvious. We know it. But we, you know, how we know it is often based on some very clever astronomy and other things. Here is an example. It seems that Greek dates between the 4th and the 1st century BC are not entirely certain. When I read this some years ago, I found it disturbing because I assumed that it was a fixed and certain fact that Xerxes invaded Greece in 480 BC and Alexander the Great died in Babylon in 323 BC. I was willing to accept that the date of Julius Caesar's birth is a little variable. It might have been 106 BC, it might have been 100 BC, but I thought the overall scheme was solid, like granite, but it isn't. So in what year were the Athenians defeated in Sicily, the Sicilian expedition? Well, 
the defeat, we're told by Thucydides, was occasioned by reaction to a total eclipse of the moon. Using Thucydides, who is our most reliable historian, he mentions two solar eclipses, one in the first year of the war between Athens and Sparta, and one in the seventh year. He also mentions that this lunar eclipse took place in the 19th year of the war. Looking at what Thucydides says about these astronomical events, and also trying to fit this in with what else we know from other records in other civilizations, it seems that the first solar eclipse was on the 3rd of August 431 BC, the second solar eclipse on the 21st of March 424 BC, and therefore the lunar eclipse seen in Sicily on the 27th of August 413 BC. However, I have seen arguments in the academic literature which say that another possible date for the Sicilian expedition is on the 18th of August 385 BC. If you look at the pattern of solar and lunar eclipses, thank you, my dear, and if you look at other evidence, it's not absolutely certain that the eclipse that stopped Nicias from retreating from Syracuse, it's not entirely certain that that particular eclipse was on the 27th of August 413 BC. It may have been on the 18th of August, 385 BC. And if it was, you may say, well, you know, what is it? It's um, 40 years or so. Does it matter? And the answer is, yes, it does matter. It matters enormously because this would disorder every other date in Greek and to some extent in Roman history. It would mean telescoping events together. It would mean giving up on certain schemes of explanation. It would mean, sorry, the phrase, it would be necessary to rewrite the history books. That's been greatly overused in recent years. But if we were to redate that lunar eclipse from 413 BC to 385 BC, it would require us to rewrite the whole of Greek and, as I said, to some extent, Roman history. Let's come back to the Bronze Age. How do we know when things happened in the Bronze Age? We do much the same as in the hypothetical examples that I've given. You take the Sumerian and the Egyptian records, and these are lists of kings, lists of officials. They're lists, they're dating lists, they're relative chronologies, and you try to match them together. It's quite useful, for example, that the Egyptians and the Hittites both have narratives that have survived of the Battle of Kadesh, the great battle between the Egyptian and the Hittite empires that led to a lasting and a very long peace between the two empires. Both empires recorded this and we can therefore relate the Hittite and the Egyptian dating systems to each other in this way. On top of these synchronicities which have been made up during the past 200 years, and just think that it, it's an enormous cat's cradle of inferences looking through the surviving literary evidence and archaeological evidence, looking for things that you can relate together. On top of this, you add your attempts at absolute chronology. So there is something called the Venus Tablet of Amisaduka, which I give on the right of this slide. This is a record of the movements of Venus during the reign of a Babylonian king, and he was the fourth ruler after Hammurabi. Using this... This record purports to show the rise of Venus together with the new moon. It provides three possible points of, ref of reference for the accession of Hammurabi.
According to the High Chronology, Hammurabi became king of Babylon in 1848 BC, or the Middle Chronology says 1792 BC, and the Short, or the Low Chronology, says 1736 BC. So you have a difference of just over a century in the possible dates for when Hammurabi became the king of Babylon. Once you choose any one of those three dates, then you can relate almost all other events in Babylonian, and because of the synchronicities found between Babylonian and Egyptian events, because of the surviving diplomatic correspondence between those two states, you can bolt on dates in Egyptian history. But you can see that the pattern of movements between Venus and the Moon, they give you three possible points of reference, and there's a century difference between them. So even when you have the recording of astronomical events, they do not always give you absolutely unambiguous dates. They may give you a range of dates because astronomical events tend not to be singular. They do tend to repeat. The planets move around. Objects outside the Earth, rather, they move around in complex but generally repeating patterns. A question about Halley's Comet as an absolute reference point. That is an absolute point, as long as you accept that it is Halley's Comet. We could date the Norman Conquest to 1066 by looking at the movements of Halley's Comet. It seems to have turned up at the time, and very conveniently you can see it portrayed in the Bayeux Tapestry. It seems that Halley's Comet turned up again in the year that Caesar was killed. So if there was any doubt about the year in which Caesar w was murdered, you could say, ah, well, this is a clear reference to Halley's Comet. But you see, it might not have been Halley's Comet. It might have been a comet with a very eccentric orbit that turned up at that time and it's since disappeared, not to come back for another 40,000 years. It's a fair assumption that the comet that Plutarch refers to as having blazed in the sky when Caesar was assassinated was Halley's Comet, but it's by no means certain as I said, it's possible that this was a comet that has a 40,000-year cycle. It hasn't come back, and it won't come back for a very long time, but it happened then, and perhaps Halley's Comet turned up two years later. A question about the possibility that comets and other events that are really widely spaced are sometimes conflated. That's a very unpleasant possibility, but it's not a possibility we can exclude, yes. It is possible. It is possible. Indeed, even occurrences as regular as Halley's Comet are not completely reliable. Halley's Comet last came back in 1984, I think. I went out night after night looking for the thing and didn't see it. I froze myself half to death with my two-inch refractor looking for the thing. This is the conventional chronology. This has taken two centuries to work out, and as I said, by using astronomical data recorded, and remember this astronomical data is not recorded with the kind of pre precision that you'll find since the 17th century in Europe, nothing like Flamsteed's map of the stars or anything, but using astronomical data, and using other possible dating systems, and then by looking for synchronicities, looking for things like the date of the Battle of Kadesh in the Egyptian and the Hittite records, or looking for diplomatic correspondence in which a Babylonian king writes to an Egyptian pharaoh, using that sort of synchronicity, we have these possible chronologies for Egypt and Babylon. It looks quite good. You've got high and low points for when things happened, 
and they're not that far apart. They're about 40 years apart in most cases, 40 years apart, 30 years apart, what have you. The Babylonian chronology is it's rather less it's rather less close together, but again you don't have such big discrepancies. As I said, it's taken two centuries. Ever since I suppose Champollion cracked the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and then ever since we began digging up those tablets all over Mesopotamia and uh, reading the inscriptions that still survived above ground uh, and looking at things like pottery and, oh, looking at this, that and the other. This is the established chronology of the Near East. And because the Babylonian and Egyptian chronologies are the best that we have, they are the most reliable, the most solidly established, though even so you must accept that they are still to some extent floating, there is nothing as absolutely certain as our knowledge that the Great War began on the 4th of August 1914. Even when you accept that these are to some extent floating, it's a fairly fixed float. It's floating between high and low points. You use this to try to date everything else in the Levant. If, when you're digging up a site in Crete, you find some Egyptian artefact that can be dated to the reign of, I don't know, Amenhotep III, you can say, ah, this site probably exists within this range of dates. If you look at this style of Minoan pottery, and bear in mind that this would have been contemporary with the reign of Amenhotep III, you can look at this earlier kind of pottery. And so you use this in order to try to date other events. One of the students reminds me that a scarab of Nefertiti was found in the Uluburun shipwreck. Ah, that's always the problem, you see, Marilyn. It might have been an antique. Archaeologists in North America keep digging up Roman coins and saying, surely the Romans came to America. No, no. What happened was that in the 19th century, there was a custom of putting Roman coins into the foundations of buildings that were subsequently burned down or demolished so when you dig up a Roman coin on the outskirts of New York, it does not mean that a Roman ship turned up in the reign of Diocletian. It means that some American in 1887 put it there. And it's the same with the scarab of Nefertiti. It may have been an antique. It's not an anomaly. It's just that these objects are pretty, they're long-lasting, and so there's no reason why it shouldn't have been around for a long time after it was made. The most you can say is that the Uluburon shipwreck could not have taken place before the time of Nefertiti, but it may have taken place at any time thereafter, but at least it tells you something. But you have to be very careful and very modest with these dates. Our belief that we have something approaching absolute dates for the Bronze Age depends, I believe, on that Babylonian tablet recording the movements of Venus and the Moon. You bolt onto that the relative chronologies of Egypt and other Near Eastern empires, and king lists and diplomatic correspondence, and you get that. But there are still problems. There is the problem of corrupt texts and multiple and divergent copies, as I said earlier, you have difficulties with translation. We cannot read these ancient languages with as great a fluence as we can read Greek and Latin, or Arabic, or Sanskrit. And then you have the possibility of fabrication. I don't want to say anything about the veracity of the Bible. I don't wish to say anything for or against that. But if you look at the ages of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Abraham, you can see what are on the face of it some unlikely lifespans. It's possible that this is an accurate portrayal of what happened. 
when I was looking these up last night, I came across a website which claimed that this is proof that in the early days of creation, human lifespan amounted almost to infinity, and it's only with our increasing corruption as a race that our lifespan has come down to a maximum of 120 years. But I think a more reasonable inference from these lists is that they have been put in by various scribes at various times who are trying to cover up gaps in the chronologies available to them. In order to make a number of divergent chronologies, imagine, imagine some committee of Jewish scribes around 800 BC dealing with a great mass of differing chronologies and records from the past, all with uncertain dates on them. And the only way in which you can reconcile these is by saying, OK, Adam lived for 930 years. Do you think that is entirely likely? I don't know, but if you say he lived for 930 years, it fits into the list. And so we'll say that Seth lived for 912 years. That works. These lifespans were put in because it's the only way to make sense of what otherwise would be a random mass of uncertainty. And although the Egyptian and the Babylonian king lists do not generally record such long reigns, although there was an Egyptian pharaoh, Pepi II, who said to have reigned for 90 years, which is not impossible, but it's not hugely likely either. Although you don't see such enormous unlikelihoods in the Egyptian or the Babylonian king lists, it is possible that reigns have been lengthened or shortened or that entirely fictitious kings have been stuffed into the chronology to make the list internally consistent, and therefore that what we're looking at is an unreliable chronology. Fabrication, and I'm not talking about malicious fabrication, I'm just talking about the kind of fabrication that must be made in order to harmonise various divergent accounts. What I'm saying is that almost every date given in the histories that we write of the Bronze Age are based on daisy chains of inference. So I've given an example here. A Hittite date is based on the assumed date from Egyptian diplomatic correspondence. This in turn is based on the assumption that correspondence with Babylon can be dated to the much earlier astronomical data. At every point, at, at every join in this daisy list of inferences, you are trusting the accuracy of the materials that we have. There is nothing approaching certainty with regard to any date in the Bronze Age. And let me go a little further. Look at that, the Santorini eruption. This was a gigantic volcanic eruption. You can see the evidence in the Greenland ice cores. You can also see it in the sequoia tree rings. And you can see layers of ash and various archaeological digs. You can see evidence of the Santorini eruption wherever you care to look. But when did it happen? This was the biggest natural disaster of the Bronze Age. This appears to have ended Minoan civilization and it appears to have disrupted all the other Levantine civilizations. But when did it happen? Well, the best radiocarbon date we have is between 1627 and 1600 BC. That's based on an olive branch buried by the ash fall from the eruption. And there's also animal bones in Palai Castro in Crete. It looks as though we've got a date for the Santorini eruption. It's just that if you take that date of 1627 to 1600, it doesn't fit in with the established chronology. You see, according to the painfully reconstructed chronology 
of ancient Egypt, that eruption must have happened around 1550 BC, not in not perhaps in 1627. There is a 70 or a 50-year gap, there's a 50-year discrepancy between the historical dates that we've reconstructed and the probable date of the Santorini eruption. And as I said, you cannot entirely trust radiocarbon dating. It seems to be a good system, but it is not perfect. And if you can't reconcile those dates... What hope do you have of reconciling any other set of dates? This brings me to David Roll. Anyone heard of him? A lively discussion in which some of the students show a strong disdain for David Roll. I tend to agree with you, but David Roll is not in the same league as that rather strange German who talks about the missing centuries. Also, I'm told that if you take into account the archaeological evidence from Palestine, all of his objections fall to the ground. But, you know, as I said, he may be wrong, and I'm inclined to believe that he is wrong because I would find it very inconvenient to agree with him. Now, that's no reason for disagreeing with him. It's not a good reason for disagreeing, but it is a reason. It would be very inconvenient if he were correct. He's the one who says there was no Dark Age. What he does is to look at the evidence and he says that everything fits much better if you rub out that 300-year Dark Age and you move everything forward into the first millennium. So, have a look here. The reign of Akhenaten, which I'll discuss next week, the conventional dating is 1370 to 1353 BC. Roll says, no, 1020 to 103 BC. And the fall of Troy, which is what this course is partly about, the conventional dating says, oh, 1150. Roll says, no, 850. This is on the edge of the historical period in Greece. If you redate the fall of Troy to 850 BC, the emergence of classical Greece follows within a couple of generations. There is no gap. There is no Dark Age. The Late Bronze Age ends just before the beginning of the Greek historical record. What do we say about this? As I said, when you go back to look at the eclipse of Nicias... Redating it from 413 to 385 would be very unwelcome because it would disorder our entire chronology of Greek history, a chronology which I had always, until not that long ago, regarded as fixed, as completely certain or as reasonably certain as the date of Elizabeth I. But David Roll is coming forward with what he claims to be a mass of reliable evidence. A learned discussion among the students of the dates and the archaeological evidence in question. Although three of us now don't accept this, it is something to take into account. There's a story about Charles II. He once said, you seem to know a lot about everything. Can you tell me why it is that if you put a live fish into a jar of water, it doesn't increase the weight by as much as if you kill that fish and put it back into the water. Why is it that a dead fish in water is heavier than a live fish? The members of the Royal Society set about trying to explain this, and they came up with increasingly elaborate explanations until Charles pointed out but there is, of course, no difference in the weight between a live fish and a dead fish. You've made a false assumption about the truth of a statement and you've then made up increasingly complex hypotheses to explain it. And it is possible, it is conceivable, that Roll is right. I don't think he is, but it is possible that he's right and that we don't need to make up all of these elaborate explanations about the late Bronze Age collapse because it didn't happen. 
there was a more or less seamless movement from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age that we all know and love. Although his evidence is a bit fishy, and although it's subject to a lot of attack, it's not in the same league as that rather strange German who claims that the Middle Ages were a conspiracy between the great powers of the day. Look at those shifting dates. That would be a radical rewriting of the history of the Bronze Age in the Levant. There's the evidence that he gives. I'm not competent to discuss the truth of his claims, but he does rely quite a lot on the dating of a, of a sunset solar eclipse. He says that this happened on the 9th of May 1012 BC, not in the middle of the 14th century BC. He also claims that the 21st and 22nd dynasties in Egypt were not consecutive, that is not one after the other, but they happened side by side. He also claims that redating the 12th dynasty in Egypt to the 17th century BC gives a better fit for recorded lunar phenomena. Again, I'm not competent to discuss that, but if his evidence is good, then you can close the Dark Age. In the blue box here, oh, and there's his book on the right. A good-natured discussion of Eric von Daniken and a rejection of my claim that you should not judge a book by its cover. Apparently there are some books that can be judged by their cover. I've taken this from the product description on Amazon. It has long been believed that the great historical events described in the Old Testament were mythological. The accepted chronology world, David Roll, attempts to prove that the events of the Bible really did happen, as recorded in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Judges, Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. Now, you can see that there is an agenda here. But just because there is an agenda does not mean that the evidence is bad. As I said, you should try not to judge a book by its cover, and you should also try not to judge hypotheses by the agenda behind them. Facts are facts, and they must be considered in their own light. It is difficult sometimes, but it is something that we should try to do. A student points out that no one believed Troy did exist until Schliemann found it. You can, and this has happened repeatedly in our own lives, in our own lifetimes. In the 1980s, there were a couple of Australian doctors who had a good look at certain duodenal ulcers, and these had always been put down to lifestyle, and they were to be managed by changes in lifestyle. And these Australians said, no, it's, uh, it's a bacterium, and you can treat it with antibiotics. It caused a scandal within the medical profession, and these men came close to being struck off, uh, struck off the medical register, until it turned out that, yes, indeed, some ulcers are indeed caused by bacterial infections, and they can be cured with antibiotics, which lifted a great burden of discomfort from millions of people. And at first, these men were laughed at, they were denounced, and there were steps taken to punish them for their heresy against the, uh, against the established medical claims. So even in our own lifetimes, there have been radical reconsiderations of what we had previously taken for granted. And let's not start talking about the arguments over causes of obesity, whether it's too many calories or too many carbohydrates. If we accept David Pohl's arguments, there is no Bronze Age collapse, and we must rewrite the history of the ancient Levant, and we must also, to some extent, rewrite the history of classical Greece. This would be very inconvenient, because having to give up on fixed assumptions and discard a mass of inferences from those assumptions is always inconvenient, but it is 
it, it is the sign of a scientific civilization that when the evidence compels you in one particular direction, you move in that direction. The question is, has Roll made a good case? I'm not sure that he has. Another student discussion of Roll and the nature of relative chronology. The conventional chronology, that deals with uncertainty in terms of decades. Let me go back to it. There we are. Th this is the uncertainty with the conventional chronology. This is a degree of uncertainty we can live with. Th these are not large gaps in the record, and as I said, we can live with that. It doesn't. If you take the high or the low period, it doesn't upset the general history of the region. But if you accept Rawls redatings, which are not a matter of 50 years here and there, it's a matter of centuries, then you might as well throw away entire libraries of histories written of Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and everywhere else, uh, writ written since about 1850, because they would all be wrong. I suppose I could close by saying that one of the arguments that John Stuart Mill gives in favour of freedom of speech is that even bizarre and scandalously false claims can be useful because they bring us to a better appreciation of the truth. You could argue that although Roll is almost certainly wrong, he has done everyone a favour by reminding us that all of these chronologies we've been putting together over several centuries are based on daisy chains of inferences that are not always very well established and that perhaps we should work a little harder to establish the facts, that the facts as they are given in the conventional chronology are they're the best we've got and it may be that the only real variations are those 50-year bands between high and low. The whole question of the Bronze Age collapse, the fall of Troy, the Sea Peoples and everything, it's all based on the assumption that the conventional chronology is an established truth. And the conventional chronology, as I, as I keep on saying, is a daisy chain of inferences in which we try to tie everything back to those Babylonian records of Venus and the Moon, and we are assuming that the evidence that we have of those observations has been correctly translated and correctly interpreted.